morning. So we're going to talk about spine trauma imaging today. The reason why we need to image a patient with spine trauma is firstly to make the diagnosis of a vertebral fracture, to classify the fracture, to be able to define whether the injury is stable or unstable, to pick up any neurological compromise, and finally, based on imaging, to plan the appropriate treatment for the patient. The risk of missing a spinal injury could be a major permanent disability and a catastrophe for the patient. There's no controversy that the imaging should be emergent and appropriate for a patient of spine trauma. In the cervical spine, on the AP and lateral views x-rays, uh, on the AP view, what we should look for is that the tips of spinous processes of the vertebra should be in the midline and on a straight line. The lateral margin of vertebral bodies should again form a straight line and the lateral margin of vertebral body should be equidistant from the midline or the spinous processes. On the lateral view, there are four lines which you should look at in the cervical spine, the line along the anterior margin of vertebral bodies, the line along the posterior margin of vertebral bodies, the spine or laminar line, and the line joining the tips of spinous processes. They should all form a smooth curve and should be continuous broken, then you should suspect some kind of spine fracture. The ideal modality of imaging for a patient with spine trauma is the multi-detector CT, which is a modality of choice. The best part is that even CT done for chest abdominal pelvic injuries, we can reconstruct the images of spine and the patient need not go a separate CT scan of the spinal column for picking up the spine. So MDCT has become now the standard protocol in assessing patients of trauma. Uh, if any neurological deficit is suspected, then further MRI can be done in these patients to look for cord injuries, for other soft tissue injuries, and the posterior ligamentous complex injury. Uh, the best thing is to look at all the cuts of the MDCT, which is the axial cut, the sagittal cut and the coronal cut to be able to define and get the best diagnosis and the inference of the spine fracture. If you look at only one cut, it is likely that you might miss certain nuances which should be picked up when you assess all the cuts of the CTs. If you suspect that vertebral arteries are also involved, then a CT angiography can be done at the same time. Common injury in the cervical spine is a hyperflexion type of injuries, uh, which can be picked up to the, on the CT scan by obvious either compression fracture or subluxation or dislocation of the vertebra, superior vertebra on the inferior vertebra. And the thing to look for on the CT scan is either on the parasagittal cuts, there would be either a perching of the facets or there could be a break in the facets along with dislocation, there could be uncovering as well as they could be a jumped facet, which could be either unilateral or bilateral. Uh, normally on the axial cut of a cervical spine, subaxial vertebra, you will find that the, that the facets look like a burger, a ham which is called the hamburger sign. If there's a dislocation, the burger is reversed and it is called a uh, reversed hamburger sign. In case of bilateral pestle dislocation, you will have reversed hamburger sign on both the sides. Uh, you should possibly get an MRI done to look for any kind of any kind of cord lesion and you can see a contusion along with the edema here. Or you could pick up subtle signs like the tearing of facet capsules, clearly seen here along with covering of the facet joint and obviously to look for any kind of cord injury uh, in such cases. Uh, Fracture which is peculiar to the cervical subaxial spine is a flexion tear drop fracture, again caused by a flexion hyperflexion type of injury in which there is a fracture of the anterior inferior call, inferior portion of the cervical vertebra along with the retropulsion of the vertebral body. And the same can be picked up uh, on the MRI and it's a highly unstable fracture and can cause severe cervical cord damage. Another fracture, which is com another fracture which is common is the, along with the 
hyperfraction you have axial loading of the of the vertebra which can cause a bus fracture it is like a commonly seen bus fractures in the thoracic and lumbar spine they shattering of the vertebral bodies and it's broken and it could be a retropulsion along with damage to the cervical cord uh, a peculiar injury which is seen especially in the fused spines like ankylosing spondylitis and dish is the hyperextension injury uh, this spine acts like a carrot and breaks into two parts more akin to the femoral shaft fracture with two columns and there's a hyperextension kind of injury breaking you know the, these two act like the shaft of femur and there's a break in the uh, shaft of femur sort of a fracture akin to a soft front femur fracture with two long columns highly unstable injuries which should be surgically treated and the fracture which is seen in the upper cervical spine is the extension teardrop of fracture normally seen uh, by and large in the upper cervical spine again there is a avulsion fracture of the anterior end of the vertebra uh, the annulus tears all and the annulus tears the anterior inferior part of the fracture stable in, uh, inflection and there is no retropulsion seen in this case uh, we could have a hyperflexion sort of injury with rotation which can be picked up either on coronal cts or on axial cts in which two contiguous vertebra will be seen in rotation uh, mri is very important to look at the injury to the disc which can see which is seen here as a as a bright signal or the plc which is again see here, seen here on a stern image there is a bright signal and the plc is torn or to look at the ligament the transverse ligament in case of a dense dense injury uh, the transverse ligament is torn here or to look at the plc uh, and the fracture edema the different kind of of imaging which you can see uh, on the mri the cord injuries is edema which will be seen as a bright signal on t2 uh, it's like a flame shaped sort of uh, uh, appearance which you get or there could be contusion which again is a bright signal but it's confined to the site of maximum injury Uh, contusions could be hemorrhagic, which is seen here, which will be seen as a dark signal on T2 due to the hemosiderin, or non-hemorrhagic. And then, obviously, uh, transaction of cord is easily picked up on an MRI. And later on, this could uh, result into a myelomalacia, again seen as a very bright signal on T2 and a hyper signal on T1. And again, on a on a T1 image, you can see a hematoma. Uh, in thoracolumbar spine, it is easy to think of injuries as either a compression fracture due to flexion or a uh, flexion distraction injuries in which there's distraction of the posterior elements and compression of anterior elements or it could be a fracture dislocation uh, or a translation as in type c injuries the important thing is to look at the plc on a mri and the best views to look the uh, look at the plc on the mri is either a either the star image to suppress the fat or a t2 satu fat saturated image in which you can see the supraspinous ligament as a dark band uh, you can see the ligament of flavum again as a dark band you can see the interspinous ligaments and on the and on the transverse cuts you can see the ligament of flavum you can see the supraspinous ligament and then you can see the facet capsules also uh, this should be looked at on a t2 Uh, either t2 fat suppressed image or a stern image uh, the typical impaction type of fractures caused by flexion the hallmark of this injury is that only the anterior part of vertebral body is involved and the posterior vertebral body wall or the margin will be intact in this cases um, seen beautifully on the mri only the only the anterior part of the vertebra is compressed here and the posterior part of the vertebral body is intact and you can see the dark band of uh, plc is intact the supraspinous ligament the flavum the ligamentum flavum the interspinous ligament they are all intact so it's important to see similar things seen on the stir image the same picture this is the t2 vertebral image and the stir so the same thing can be seen that plc is intact uh, the compression injury could involve both the superior and inferior end plate and the classic split fracture which we get on the ct again the important thing is that the posterior margin of vertebral body will be intact uh, however if there is a there is a axial loading along with the flexion injury then it could look 
it could result in the classic buzz fracture in which the shattering of the vertebral body but the most important thing to look it is whether the posterior part of vertebral body is injured the posterior margin would definitely be injured in a buzz fracture and you could get a retropulsion along with neurological deficit or even without a deficit and the role of mri and plc injury comes there we could have a flexion distraction type of injury which could run through the bone you can see here the fracture line is running through the mid part of the vertebral body and exiting through the spinous process this is a classic flexion distraction type of injury or a chance fracture running through the bone you could have a uh, have a flexion distraction type of injury which could be purely ligamentous in this case it's running through the disc and through the plc you can see the classic sign of increase in the interspinous distance on ct scan in a case of flexion distraction injury and avulsion fracture of the posterior part of annulus here so this again is a sign of flexion distraction injury uh, again here you can see the fracture is exiting through the bone here but going into the soft tissue so this is a soft tissue uh, injury in a case of flexion distraction fracture or you could have the hyperextension type anterior distraction type of injury b3 classically seen in fused spines like ankylosing spine and dish type of a picture so they act like two long segments and they highly unstable injury and then finally you could have the fracture dislocation or translation type of injuries along with the rotation uh, seen here you have a uh, uh, sort of a flexion injury along with a dislocation. Uh, then you could have a flexion distraction injury again here. These are all translation and type C injuries in which the whole, all the three columns of the vertebral body, uh, the spine as such are involved. They are highly unstable injuries or you could have the same in which there is a shear fracture both in the coronal plane and in the cerebral plane. Uh, the important thing is to look at the plc injury on the mri especially in case of bus fractures to decide whether the injury is stable or unstable and uh, injury to the plc would look like a discontinuation of the supraspinous dark band on a t2 fat suppressed image or on a stir image you can see the plc injured and you can have a bright signal edema running through uh, through the plc complex so it's important to pick up the plc injury then that's why MRI is very important, especially if you have to decide the stability of the fracture. So finally, the checklist we should look at on the CT scan is look at the injury pattern, the mechanism of injury try to decipher whether it's a compression injury, it's a burst fracture. Look at the basic morphology of the morphology of the lesion. Look if there's any vertebral body height loss, if there's any retropulsion of the fragment into the canal. Uh, try to assess the degree of kyphosis and on the CT scan, try to infer if there's any PLC injury, which could have happened by uh, looking at the facet joint widening, look at the interspinous distance widening, look if there's any spinous process, emergent fracture, and any obvious vertebral body subluxation or dislocation. On the MRI, uh, look at the status of the PLC by looking at the supraspinous, infraspinous, interspinous, ligament of flammum, phasor capsules, they'll all be edema on T2 stir images. Look at the status of disc, look at the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. And finally, look at the neurologic injuries of the patient in the spinal cord, cord equina, any nerve root injury, or if there's epidural hematoma. So to conclude, uh, from the imaging, we should try to decipher the mechanism of injury, whether for the flexion injury, hyperextension injury, does it involve any axial loading or if it's a flexion distraction injury look at the morphology of the injury if it's a compression burst or dislocation kind of an injury uh, level of injury would be obvious look at the status of the disc plc if there's any epidural hem hematoma uh, look at the <clears throat> status of the cord cord if it is injured and finally all this imaging should help to formulate a treatment plan thanks very much for patient hearing.